So where where do you fall in terms of the science, your you know, your coaching, your own experience? Is there an ideal in terms of how much meat someone should eat, how slow they should progress into carnivore and the macros? I mean, what are your recommended yep. macros on a carnivore diet? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, I do advocate for carnivorous lifestyles for people, all people. I, I, I'm yet, I met, yet to meet a human being who is so physiologically different from myself that it won't work for them at all. Um, we are all the same species after all. We are all wired the same way, pretty much within, you know, functional working constraints. So, yeah, I do advocate for that. Macros wise is a bit individual in terms of what works n equals one for, for a person. That's best established in the first year or so through experimentation. Rule of thumb, a starting point for me, as I usually say to people, you should have an amount of protein on your plate equal to 1.5 grams per kilogram of lean body mass per day. And once you've got that together and know what that is, you should have around the half that volume of fat as well, i.e. about the same number of I'm not even going to say the C word that describes energy and food. I'm just going to call it the energy and food. So, yeah, so you've got basically 50-50 in terms of energy there, and then you, you would adjust from there, always in the direction of more fat, it turns out, usually. Um, the, usually the 50% starting place is a tolerable place to start, but not a place to finish for most people. And the, the design is that you get the vast majority of your energy from fats, because also the design is that the vast majority of the protein that you consume should be used for making proteins, not yeah. for oxidizing to, to release ATP. So um, that's that's how all of that works. I mean, it seems to go together that way. And yeah, and then just over a couple of years, dial in. Um, often there are issues if people are not progressing slowly. I generally have people look at at least a six week transition in terms of changing your diet across the actual metabolic adaptation period for a full metabolic adaptation, I think, to a fully carnivore diet seems to me to be around about 20 plus or minus six weeks. Mm. A long time that you don't just change your metabolism over sweet, no problem. It needs to adjust. A lot, I feel that a lot of people start working with me at least six months into the diet where maybe they weren't eating. And a lot of the women I work with, they're not eating enough. And for the men, they're eating a lot more protein that are that's much leaner. And so they're not getting enough of the fat. And so oftentimes, if you add the fat, then they feel better, they'll sleep better through the night, but then they have to work on the gut because then they start having loose stools because they can't tolerate yeah. the yeah. higher fat. And so it's the yeah. conundrum. But oftentimes then some people will say, well, then I'll just add carbs and the carbs will stop the loose stools. So, mm. Yeah, but then as soon as you do that, you're activating the Randall cycle and that's going to lead you to problems. So what is that exactly? So the Randall cycle is a little bit of machinery that exists in your metabolic pathway that says if you have an overplus of fat in a cell, that fat will lock out sugar for entry into the mitochondria. And thus that fat, which is pooling, will be used first. At the same time, if there is an overplus of sugar in the cell trying to enter the mitochondria, it will lock out the fat. So you've got things basically locking each other out, so nothing gets in. So then what happens is the cellular redox state of the cell has to drop necessarily because now the energy provision dips below the energy utilization, despite there being pools of energy struggling for entry. Sure. And if you reduce the redox state of the cell, that necessarily means there's an increase in the cytosolic concentration of inorganic phosphate ions, HPO for negative charge. Um, and those tend to directly activate pro-inflammatory cytokines, mm and also directly activate other metabolic enzymes involved in the storage of fat. In other words, turning off the usage of fat, 
which leads to chronic insulin insensitivity, type 2 diabetes, obesity, heart disease, strokes, many forms of cancer, most forms of dementia, etc. So the whole thing with diet is if you're on the carnival end and you eat no carbs ever to speak of, you're kind of safe from the Randall cycle. Yeah. If you're a vegan and you eat nothing but grass, sorry, vegans, plant material, fibrous plant material, poisonous, toxic, anti-nutrient laden, pro-inflammatory material, like if that's what you do, cool, you're safe from the Randall cycle too. However, in five to seven years, your health will fall to bits because of the nutrient deficiencies over here. These guys are still going strong. That's the difference. Sure. That's how I've kind of, that's how I lay my cart out in terms of, there's what, the, you know, we don't have good science here, but we do have some pretty good, pretty good anecdotes. Yeah. yeah. What's interesting is you're talking about um, some of the pairing of foods. And I remember in school, we, in our nutritional therapy school, they would talk about how they said certain macros would get absorbed first. And so mm. if you want to play that digestion card, you want to maybe, it might've been eat the meat first and then the fat. And I, I forget exactly, but okay. lately mm. what I've been hearing is that there's a group of people that say you should eat meat with carbohydrates because then it can slow down some of the glucose um, absorption. And then they're also saying fat and it's like the opposite of what I've learned, right? It's the pairing of glucose with fat that's so mm. not ideal, like what you just talked about. So is and why why would you want to add carbohydrates with your meat? I don't know. I mean, that's what that's what this you know these people are advocating for. And but I mean, it, it's it's weird because still after all of this and after all the discussion, all the argumentation, after all the point and counterpoint, I can still go to any metabolic textbook in existence ever written and look up what the exact dietary requirement for carbohydrates is for human beings on a daily basis, the answer is not one gram ever. Right. None. Yes. No, and, I, and I'm in full agreement, but they'll say, well, you know, the brain and certain parts of the body need glucose and yes, you Glucose neogenesis. Right. But then they say, but that's a not ideal process for your endocrine system and so the natural state your like brain needs is sugar and so why don't you feel it with some of that yeah, so that comes from an argument an argument standpoint goodness, where you're suggesting that moving away from the natural state in a time of stress is in and, in and of itself a contraindicated thing that you should never ever be stressed if that were the case then you can stop exercising because that's, that's a stress. So if stress is inherently bad and should never be experienced, then stop exercising. Yeah. And I think they argue that um, exercise is a momentary stress and then the net, net is a positive gain, whereas mm -hmm. eating a ketogenic diet long term is not a net positive. And like, so the thing is, my only concern, again, is that I see a ton of people eat their steaks or their you know their carnivorous plus an abundance of fruit mm. and i don't even know how much i'm um, one person recently told me that they are carnivore but all of a sudden they um change something in their life and now they're highly stressed and so i asked them like what else do you eat other than meat and this person eats like 10 tablespoons of honey and so the person came to me for gut healing, but when I looked at their information, it was a blood sugar dysregulation. And I don't think people understand that because other advocates are saying, no, it's good to eat meat with your fruit. Yeah. And that's, I guess, again, brings us back to the problem where there are so many people running around saying so many different things and all believing what they're saying is you know, good and full of veracity and backed by all the best science available. Um, it's a difficult one. How do we get to the truth of it all? Um, or, well, or how do you help? Channel? Or, <laughs> or, right. And we'll put links to um, your channel in the show notes, but what would you recommend for people that are saying they have lower energy on carnivore? And let's say if they've done it for a while now, and I'm, yep. I'm assuming they're eating meat only. Yep. Typically, when I hear that, I hear that from a carnivore that's been doing it six months, 
is about the number where they'll start saying, you know, I actually feel like I've lost energy. I don't feel like I'm quite as sharp and uh, yes. all that kind of stuff. That's immediately before the point which they probably are actually going to start coming right. It's kind of the last bit of the adaptation phase. I was talking about that 20 plus or minus six weeks sort of thing. Um, and it's, it's right at that point where they're most likely to actually cave in and pour some carbohydrates down the neck. The worst, because they're actually just just there on the precipice and their their metabolism was just about to make the final okay right we need to rely more on this pathway and put this one over here out of so much commission because they're not feeding me sugar i need to make it over here takes a while to get your body to do it what i usually suggest to those people is just a bit of patience here mm. see what happens um i mean you can experiment with putting in different amounts of carbohydrate and stuff at that at that stage but really to me it's kind of undermining everything you've been doing for the six months leading up to that point right um because you're now looking for negotiating a way back in for carbs when really what we're saying is there's no place for them yeah there is no requirement for carbs in the diet that's the whole thing with gluconeogenesis it is once it's adapted fully it is a demand driven process not a supply driven process right when your brain detects that you need more energy, it produces it. When your brain detects that your blood sugar is low because your muscles are using it or whatever, it, it sends the, the signal to upregulate that pathway and get that stabilized again. And any amount of pouring carbohydrates in with the food tends to work against that, especially if you're gonna mix any amount of fat at all in that diet which you absolutely should because if you don't you're going to be deficient on fat soluble things sure mm. and at the end of the day judy it, it, it works out to be one of these things that you really can't negotiate with now i'm not going to sit here and claim to be a perfect carnivore that never puts any carbohydrates or plant material into my body as i say roughly 95 but i'm also not going to sit here and say there's any indication for that five percent and i would be worse off without it I'm saying the exact opposite. I'm saying I wish I could get my discipline together to be 100% carnivore because I was so much better for the month that I did that. That's kind of where I lay out my stall on that issue. And then obviously it's, it's about having access to and talking to someone who's been through it, who understands it, right. who hopefully has some training in the area. I'm available for consultancies. We'll put a link to that under, uh, underneath as well, I guess. But Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah five mm -hmm. years is a very long time. I mean... I, I wrote my book in a way that I was hoping people can just try carnivore as an elimination diet. And the real reason mm. I did it that way is I knew that if I try to sell people on eat meat only for the rest of your life, people would say no. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But, but if I can just have people taste how good life can be eating only meat, then maybe it will never just end up being an elimination diet, but maybe they'll stay because, or always come back to it because they know how good they feel eating zero carbs. And so that's yeah. why I wrote it that way. And I, and I fully believe like what you're saying. Um, I think I nowadays eat more 95% as well, but I feel my best at a hundred. And if I have interviews or um, any important work to be done, I am eating meat only but there's just the surplus of all other foods out there, right? So even us advocating, we're saying that sometimes we let other stuff in. I think the difference between us with others is that we're not saying that it's not that a carnivore diet can't work. It can absolutely work and use levers to make it better for you individually and work with a coach. And I wonder mm. if this whole pandemic and everything that's happened that's caused cortisol to just increase that's causing people to eat more sugar or want more sugar because it's the flight or fight sta state. Yep. I think it's quite feasible. Absolutely. We are all on edge. Um, the world is suddenly precipitously changing under our feet. Yeah. There's all sorts of craziness going on. Yep. So as we're closing, what would you say, um, you know, as a coach, how should someone get properly started and then just kind of go from there? all right so typically if a person is coming from a standard western standard american diet starting point they are going to be probably consuming meat and three veg pretty much every day of the week yeah. they are going to be consuming 
for breakfast, high in grains and sugars and probably gluten and probably dairy of a um, of a processed nature. Yeah, all of that kind of nonsense. The first thing that I generally do is get rid of the overtly starchy carbohydrates out of that person's diet. Anything highly processed, obviously and patently, and all oils, that's step one, all at once, all of those things over a two week period, a two week grace period, those items are weaned out of that person's diet to remain ever after, no longer part of their uh, experience of the universe, supposedly. Then from there, depending on the person, how they present, you would you would take different groups of things like leafy greens out next, or is it brassica that goes next, or is there an obvious wheat issue in this person, in which case, you know, that goes, et cetera, et cetera. And you just steadily over in blocks of two weeks, over, as I say, six or eight weeks, so up to up to two months to really slowly change the cogs around, change not only that person's eating habits in a meaningful way, but also in a way that's slow enough that that person's body will adapt to it and you won't have this dysbiosis that can actually last for years if you get this wrong and just hammer over. You can do damage to your gut function that will come back and haunt you even years later. Um, and it's just one of those things we don't understand well enough yet to, to know exactly how that's happening. But all we know is that it is happening. That And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of people that transition to carnivore, they the number one complaint is the loose stools and all the mm. other imbalances in the gut. So it makes sense. And I've tried so many different kinds of digestive enzymes, HCL, supplements of mm. different B vitamins, and not there's no one answer for everyone. And so it makes sense what you're saying. There are no proatherogenic lipoproteins. They do not exist. This is a concept. It's it's a model that we've been put in front of us. It's propaganda designed to make us fear a protein which is generated by our own bodies according to the instructions of a length of DNA which has survived four thousand million years in our in our genetic sequence that knows when to turn on and when to turn off. It knows what it's doing. It's been doing it for a very long time. And we're now telling ourselves to be afraid of that. It's just, it's just nuts. It's, it's ridiculous. Let's not overcomplicate this. Let's make it simple. The simple take home message is eat meat, drink water, add salt if you like, rest and repeat. Uh, and if you want to throw some exercise in too great, but make it high intensity and not long lasting, don't go doing any cardio. Just to be specific, um, when you mm. say long lasting, how often in a week and then how oh look you know exercise <laughs> of any kind i i usually say to people half an hour okay three times a week okay that's enough if you're doing more than three times a week more than half an hour of that kind of exercise unless you are an athlete a serious athlete with a real chance of success in athletics actually probably you're wasting a lot of that time probably most of it's actually working against you your health your long-term prospects it's an illness. Sorry, it's something that you and I probably need to talk about. Too okay. much exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm I'm on the same page. I love it. 